Matthew chapter 3. I had not been the preacher at the congregation very long before one of the members came into my office to visit me. And I'll never forget how he began the conversation. No, hello, no, how are you doing? How are things with the family? Did the move go well? None of that. He began by saying, I need you to know in advance I did it. I did it. I'm like, oh, no. What did you do? He said, I did it, Donald. I did it. And then he proceeded to tell me a story about how he had embezzled from his company that he worked for. And he began to tell me some of the reasons why and the things that were taking place in his life and, and, and how at that time he had tried to, to justify what he was doing, but he reached a point where he realized, listen, there's really no justification for the things that I'm doing. I'm a Christian. I'm guilty of what this is. So he came to my office and he said, I did it. I did it. I did it. And I'll never forget what he said next. Now, what do I do? What's my next step? What, what comes after today? How am I going to face my family? What, what is my employer going to do to me? Am I going to go to jail? Is this going to ruin my life? Well, what if it gets out to the people in the community? What are they going to say? What are they going to think? My kids are in the public school system. How's it going to affect them? And on and on and on and on. But he kept coming back to that same point. What next? What now? What do I do? Now, I'm 26 years removed, 27 years removed from that. But it's the right question. What do we do when we realize we're wrong? What do we do when we realize we're guilty of the thing that we're coming to grips with? What is it that begins that process in our mind where we realize, you know, I'm going to have to take responsibility. for? I mean, I haven't been, but now I'm going to have to be taking responsibility for this and all of the repercussions that are going to come from it. So what's my next step? What's yours? When you reach that moment when you realize you've been wrong. When you reach that moment when you realize, I shouldn't have been doing that. I don't know what I was thinking. What is your next step? What do you do? I, I want to talk this morning about that second step. I, I, I want to talk about what is the action that begins the process of, of coming to grips with what we've done and being honest with what we've done. I want us to take a look at what the Bible says regarding biblical repentance and you. How does it happen? Does it need to happen? What takes place while it's happening? How do I handle the pressure? What am I going to do with the consequences? Is this going to destroy my life? Am I going to re recover from this? What are my fellow brothers and sisters in Christ going to say about me or to me or because of me? What's that second step when we realize that repentance is necessary. I, I want us to begin by talking about what repentance is. I think that's the best place. And I want to say, I'm going to put some definitions on the screen behind me, but before we ever look at them, I want to say this, and, and it may sound a little odd, and I'm going to explain it, but let me say this. Repentance is more than I'm sorry. I'm not saying that's not an aspect of it. I'm not saying that that doesn't play in. It's a necessary step. But repentance, biblical repentance, is more than a simple two words. I'm sorry. It's more than that. It comes from a very interesting Greek word, metanoia. And it means to change one's mind. But notice the, the, the key, for better. It means to heartily to amend with abhorrence of one's past sin. It involves a turning with contrition, uh, contrition from sin to God. 
F.F. F. Bruce, the second definition there, a noted scholar once said this, repentance places the repentant sinner in the proper condition to accept divine forgiveness. We need the forgiveness of those that we've wronged. We need the forgiveness for the things that we have committed that were wrong. We need to be a people who face the consequence for the things that we've done that have been wrong. But more than just the consequences with man, we have the consequences with God. Biblical repentance takes all of that into consideration. It's a verb, church. It's a verb. It's more than just saying a phrase, I'm sorry, it's an action. It's putting something into place. It's going in a specific direction, in a specific way. It's taking responsibility and manifesting in your life action. Action. Is that what repentance is to you? Is that how you, you know, you, you begin to process it in, in your mind? Don't, don't be afraid to look in front of you or next to you or around you. We've all been in the need to repent. We've all been there. It, it's, it's not something that just singles you out or me out. It's something where we've all found ourselves. And we've reached that moment where we need to amend. We need to make a change. We need to see whatever we've been doing as being abhorrent in our life. And we want to get the action going. We want a turning point in our life. We want to turn over, as we might say, a new leaf. We want to start things out fresh. Not just with those around us, but with God. You know, biblical repentance is a Bible topic. It's a Bible topic. And you find it all throughout the New Testament. Let me give you some examples. You find it in the preaching of John the Baptist. Look over there in Matthew chapter 3 and verse 1. It says, In those days John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he who was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way for the Lord. Make his paths straight. To prepare that way, to be a herald of Jesus Christ, he begins very specifically, Repent! Change your heart and mind. Put this into action. It's a verb. Begin doing things in your life that you need to do. Now a change is coming. Now a change is necessary. In those days John the Baptist came preaching, repent. It's also found in the preaching of Jesus. If you go over to uh, Matthew chapter 4, just go over one more chapter. Matthew chapter 4, and I want you to notice in verse 17, these words, Matthew 4 and verse 17. From that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, repent. For the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Does it sound a little familiar? It's the same message that John the Baptist was preaching. Jesus comes along and he he reaffirms the act, the verb, the action. Repentance is going to be required. There's going to be a change that is going to have to be made in our lives. Go over to the Gospel of Luke. Turn forward. Go to Luke chapter 15. And notice verse 7. Luke chapter 15 and verse 7. Jesus says, I say to you that likewise, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 just persons who need no repentance. Now, let me just look at that verse for just a moment. And when we talk about biblical repentance, when we talk about it being essential, I have no idea, friends, but it happens. I have no idea how somebody can come away from the Scripture and say that repentance is just a minor part in the bigger picture. That, you know, repentance is just one of those those lower level things that we do, right? I mean, it's not up there at the top. I mean, you know, that's getting forgiveness for our sins. That's accepting Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. That's being baptized into the blood of Jesus Christ for the remission of our sins. I mean, those are the big three. But, you know, repentance is down here. That sure doesn't sound like it's of less importance to what Jesus is saying here. He says, likewise, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents. You don't think it's important? 
People think it's just something that you kind of begin the whole process with. How important is repentance? It's more important than over 99 just persons who need no repentance. He's not putting them down. He's not saying that those individuals aren't important or aren't loved by God. But what he is saying is that repentance is vital. It's necessary. It has to be a part of our spiritual DNA makeup. It's a part of who we are. From Revelation chapter 2 and verse 5, all the way to Revelation chapter 3 and verse 19, as Jesus addresses the seven churches, repentance is used six times. That's pretty serious. That's driving home a point. Repentance was in the preaching of Jesus. Let me give you another example. Repentance was in the preaching of Peter. Probably one of the most familiar verses to you. If you go over to the book of Acts, you're in Luke, turn forward. Acts chapter 2, go down to verse 38. And Peter says these words on that great day of Pentecost, after preaching the first gospel sermon, the death, burial, and the resurrection of Jesus, Peter says this, Then Peter said to them, Repent. Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, let me remind you of this, and I'm going to say something at the very end, so we're going to visit this again, but there's no remission without repentance. And there's no remission until repentance comes first. I think that's a logical order. I think John preaches it in that way because it needs to be that way. He begins with repentance. Repent and let every one of you be baptized. Long before he talks about remission, there has to be baptism. Before there's baptism, there has to be, re- there has to be repentance. Before there's repentance, there has to be the understanding, I'm wrong, I've done it, I'm guilty, it's me, I'm the man. It's a process. It was in Peter's preaching. Repentance is also in the preaching of Paul. I want you to go over to Acts chapter 17. Acts chapter 17. And look at verse 30. Acts 17 and verse 30. Paul talking to the Areopagus, the ruling council. Think of it as city hall. Think of him talking to the city council. And all the people have come out to listen to him. Paul says, truly, these times of ignorance God overlooked. That's what you've been doing. That's how you've been living. You want me to identify what the actions have been in your life? I mean, he already said I walked around and I saw all the objects of your worship. I know you're religious people, but let me tell you what you've been done. You've been ignorant. And that needs to change. He says, these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to what? To change that heart and mind. To change the direction that the direction they're going. Some people have talked about repentance as being an about face. Of going in a new direction. I like it. I can work with it. I'll accept it. But it's that verb. It's putting out what we're doing in action. It's making progress in our life. It's more than I'm sorry. It's what do I do next? Repentance was in the preaching of Paul. Repentance needs to be a part of our preaching as well. It's not very popular today, like a lot of things, but it needs to be there. Go over to 2 Peter, or or, excuse me, uh, uh, 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy, chapter 4. Look at verse 2. Paul, in talking to this young evangelist, tells him this, preach the word. Now, Do you really think after looking at how repentance was in the preaching of John the Baptist and looking that repentance was in the preaching of Jesus and it was in the preaching of Peter and it was in the preaching of Paul, do we really think for one moment that when Paul is talking to this young man and he says, preach the word, that somehow repentance isn't included in that? I mean, there's all the big things like I talked about, baptism and remission of sin. I mean, all those things are there. That's a no-brainer. But for some reason, when Paul talks about preach the Word, that doesn't include repentance. Well, that's crazy theology. And nothing can be further from the truth. If Timothy was told to preach the Word, and we know, there's four examples behind me, and we know that the preaching of repentance was there, it needs to be there in ours. Now, I know that's not popular today. 
Because people don't like to be told that they need to change. In fact, in our society today, based on what segment of society that you are in, if you're in the, the segment of the LGBTQ, or if you're in the segment of, of, of this over here, if you're in the segment of, of that over there, if you're in the segment over here that divorce or remarriage doesn't matter, whatever segment that you're in, a lot of those have their own ideology, and in some of them, repentance isn't even necessary. Well, I'm not doing anything wrong, though I'm in a homosexual relationship. Well, I'm not doing anything wrong, though I'm on my third marriage, or my fourth marriage, or my sixth marriage. Well, I'm not doing anything wrong. Well, so I do this, or so I'm involved in that. Well, it's what I choose to do. Why should I change who I am? See, I live in the land of the free. That means I get to set my own course, chart my own way. What do we often say when we talk about those moments of standing strong and making a path? I'm the captain of my soul. But so many people are sailing in the wrong direction, aren't they? Because repentance is not part of their ideology. It's not part of who they need to be as a person. I'll say it again. There can be no remission of sins without repentance of those sins. Well, where do we go from here? Well, let me give you this. Let me give you some suggestions about having a right attitude of repentance. Okay, These are just some things that I, I want to throw out there. Some things for us to consider. But I think they work into the larger concept of what do I do now. Right? I realize that I'm wrong. I'm not there anymore. I'm not at that step. I've done the thing. It's wrong. I've realized it. Now I'm entering into the, the verb. Now I'm entering into repentance. What should that look like in my life? What attitude should I have? Right? That's where we're at. Well, let's consider this. First of all, when we talk about the right attitude, we have the right attitude and repentance towards sin. And that right attitude should be godly sorrow. Go over to 2 Corinthians 2 Corinthians, look at chapter 7, and I'll give you verses 9 and 10. 2 Corinthians 7, verses 9 and 10. Paul says, Now I rejoice, not that you were made sorry. That's, um, uh, that's Paul's way of saying, I know it hurt. Um, I know you really felt what was being said. I know what I had been writing, what I had been saying, really got you right into the heart. It, it reminds me of Peter on that day of Pentecost when they were pricked in the heart. I mean, it hit them right in the very center of who they are. And that's what Paul is talking about here in verse 9. He says, I'm not happy about it, that you were made sorry, but here's what he is happy about, but that your sorrow led to repentance. You, you, you were there at the beginning. You had that sorrow. I've done the thing that's wrong. And now I'm, begin, I'm going to begin to do in my life the repentance that was necessary. He said, for you were made sorry in a godly manner that you might suffer loss from us and nothing. For godly sorrow produces repentance leading to salvation. Now, haven't we heard that before? Without repentance, there can be no remission. Well, sure we have. For godly sorrow produces repentance, leading to salvation. Not to be regretted, but the sorrow of the world produces death. Think of Judas for a moment. Think of the closing hours of the life of Judas. Judas reaches that moment when he says, I'm wrong. Take back your money. I don't want it. What I've done is wrong. I've betrayed innocent blood. I mean, I walked with this man. I was taught by this man. I sat around the fire at night with this man. When all the crowds had been sent away, I saw the miracles. I heard the teaching. I know the texture of his beard, the color of his eyes. I mean, I know this man, and I'm wrong. He was innocent. And he throws back the money. But it's his next action. Instead of godly sorrow that leads to repentance, I need to make this right. He hangs himself. That's not godly sorrow. Well, how can you say that? He was obviously sorrowful. He was, but godly sorrow leads to repentance. I need to make the changes. I need to have the action. I need to begin to do things that I haven't been doing in my life. Godly sorrow produces repentance, which leads to salvation. That's the right attitude towards sin. Godly sorrow. 
Here's a, here's a second attitude. It's the right attitude toward God. I mean, here's the focus. I need to make it right with my brother or sister. I understand that. That's the, that's the earthly consequence or, or uh, excuse me, the earthly, the earthly um, requirement in, in dealing with those that I've wronged. I need to deal with that. But repentance also deals with our relationship with God. And the right attitude towards God is that I need to be a person who returns to Him. Go back to Luke chapter 15, the parable of the prodigal son. Go to Luke chapter 15. I'm not going to give you the whole story. I, I know you know it, but the prodigal has reached the point where he realizes that he's wrong. And he begins this process of repentance. And here's what he says in verse 18. In beginning this process, remember it's a verb, it's an action. So here's his own and go to my father and I will say to him father I have sinned against heaven and before you that repentance led the man to say I've got to get back into the presence of my father I've got to get back into the presence of the one who ultimately I've wronged. We know that he had worldly living. We know that he gave himself over to all kinds of different things. I mean, his brother really lays the indictment on him. Look at what he's done all these years. Look at how he's been acting. Look at how he's been living. And he has the nerve to crawl back home and you throw him a party? We know that his actions were ungodly. He spent his money in foolish ways. Fulfilling his lust. But he reaches that point where he knows what I did was wrong. I've cheated my father. I've cheated him out of the inheritance that he had built up for me. And now I need to go back to him. And I'm going to go to him. And I'm going to say very simply, I have sinned against heaven. And I've sinned before you. I'm guilty. I've done this thing. Godly sorrow leads us back into the presence of God where we say, listen, I need to go to God. I need to go home to God. I need to strengthen my relationship with God. The thing that I'm involved in, I know has harmed that relationship. I know it. Remember, we're, we, we're, we've, we've dealt with the individual. We've, we've dealt with the earthly. Now I understand that my relationship with God has also been damaged. And I need to do something about it. I know I'll go back to Him. I'll return to Him. Did you see Judas return to God? Did you see Judas have the mindset that says, I've got to get in prayer and I've got to go to the Father. But you see it in the prodigal. That should be our mindset. I've got to get back into the presence of God. Can I make this suggestion? And it's just a suggestion. That maybe the reason we do some of the things we do, okay, maybe the reason we do some of the things we do is because we didn't, remain in the presence of God? Does that make sense? We, we allowed ourselves to drift, drift away, you know, you, you, know, you know what I mean? We allowed ourselves to get further and further away, and the further away we get, the more we get involved in things. There's nothing so tempting as when the parents say to a teenager, we'll be back later. Oh my goodness, I remember the first time I heard that, later, I mean you're not going to be here right now? How much later? Oh, it's going to be a couple hours. A couple hours? I mean, you're not going to be around for a couple hours? There's nothing more tempting. The parents are gone. I'm not in their presence. I can do what I want to do. I remember the first time I was out of the presence of my parents. I remember as clear as day. You know what I did? Oh, well, you're going to look and say, well, we, we figured that. Here's what I remember. The first time I was out of the presence of my parents, I went and bought a gallon of ice cream. I remember it. Blue Bell. And I sat on the couch, and I proceeded to eat right out of that gallon of ice cream. Mom ain't around to say, now put it in a bowl. Mom went around to say, do you really need to scoop that big? Put some back. You know, we always had ice cream. I don't know about you, but uh, it wasn't always slick and smooth. There was always like two or three scoops that had to be put back into it, you know. So when you went to get it the next time, it was already pre-scooped. You know what I'm talking about, right? So mom would come along, that's too much. Put some back. And they were gone. We'll be back in a few hours. A few hours. And I, ooh, oh, this is great. Freedom. This is what life is like. I'm on my own. I love it. And when I got about halfway through, yeah, I made it halfway through. I began to have this nauseous feeling. Now, I love ice cream. And I love bluebell vanilla ice cream. 
But this wasn't a bluebell vanilla ice cream filly. That was the first couple scoops, right? Now it was kind of a, uh oh. It was kind of a churning. It was a kind of, you know what? I think I might revisit this ice cream again real soon. <laughs> All over everywhere. 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 Friends, it was in my shoes. It was everywhere. You know what I learned? <laughs> Okay, yeah, I, well, I still like Bluebell ice cream today, but I don't eat a gallon. Here's what I learned. We sometimes take liberties when we think we're out of the presence of an authority figure. We take liberties. The boss isn't around, I'm going to do this. A co-worker's not here to tattle on me, so I'm going to do this. And, and, and can I make that suggestion to you again, that maybe sometimes some of the problems that we get ourselves into is because we don't feel close to the presence of God. And we begin to think, well, I'm on my own. I'm out here. I can do what I want. Nobody's looking. Nobody's going to stop me. Nobody knows. And we get ourselves into situations. And before we know it, it's a bluebell ice cream situation. I'm sick. This isn't good. Why did I do it? This is a bad decision. And we regret it. That's the beginning of repentance. Maybe if we made a greater effort to feel the presence of God, m maybe we wouldn't make some of the mistakes we've made. Repentance has the attitude of saying, I need to get back to God. Let, let me give you a third one. There's the right attitude toward ourselves. We have a responsibility. To, we've been talking about our responsibility to God. We've been talking about our responsibility towards the person that we have wronged or persons that we have wronged. My friend who came to me, an entire company had been wronged. And so we've talked with that. But what about us? What is our responsibility towards ourselves? I think it's in humility. Stay there in, in Luke chapter 15, still the prodigal of the son, but go down to one uh, through the next verse, verse 19. Notice what he says about himself. He's not talking about his brother, okay? He's not talking about his father. He's, he's not talking about the people whose land, you know, he'd been living in where he squandered all of his wealth. In verse 19, he's talking about himself, and he says this to his father, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. Now, let me ask you this. Have you ever prayed something like that to God? I'm ashamed of myself. I'm ashamed of what I did. I'm ashamed of who I've become. And I'm so embarrassed to come into your presence. And I know you know it, but I know I have to say it. And I'm so embarrassed to have these things come off of my lips, to hear them voiced, to, 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 to have them ringing in my ear. I'm, I'm no longer worthy, Father. I'm no, I'm no longer worthy because of what I've done. I'm, I'm no longer worthy because I realize not only the pain I've caused others, the pain I've caused you, but the pain that's been caused in my own life. Just make me like one of your hired servants. God, don't count me as family. Count me as a slave. Count me as a servant. Count me as, as one who doesn't enjoy the benefits of, of having that, that family relationship. Right? There's a difference between how the son is treated at the dinner table and how the servant is treated during dinner. And that's what I'm asking. Not a seat at the table. Just some place in your presence. Just some place on the land. Just some place where I can get back into this story that has involved you, that once involved me. Just let me get back to the fringe. Have you ever been there? That's humility. Of seeing ourselves the way we truly ought to see ourselves. We reach that point through repentance when we realize, you know what? It wasn't all about me. It wasn't all of what I thought. You know, at that moment, you reach a point where you say, I was wrong. I'm not going to justify it. I was wrong. The part where you say, it just makes me sick what I did. And embarrassed. You ever been so embarrassed about something you did, you dreaded praying about it? I 
Repentance has a right attitude towards ourself. Humility. A, 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 it also has, um, repentance has the right attitude towards others. Let's talk about restitution. Go back to Luke chapter 19. You're in Luke 15. Turn forward. Luke chapter 15. In, uh, excuse me, Luke chapter 19. We'll go back and read Luke 15 later. That's where we are. Luke chapter 19. And you know the story that's taking place here. Uh, I'm just going to give you verse 8. Um, you know Zacchaeus. You know what he's done. He's wronged others. But I want you to notice, you know, I don't know what Jesus said at that meal. It doesn't record what Jesus said. He went in and he ate with Zacchaeus. But he must have said something very powerful because of whatever he said set Zacchaeus down the road of repentance. And I know that he must have said something that was very convicting to Zacchaeus because when you see his actions after eating with Jesus, he looks convicted. And it says in verse 8 these words, Then Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, I give half of my goods to the poor, and if I have taken anything from anyone by false accusation, I restore it fourfold. Could it be that while Jesus was sitting around the table, he said, Are any of you thieves? Are any of you cheating your fellow man? Let me ask you something. Do any of you have wealth tonight because you stole it from another person? Are any of you in a better situation, a better position today because somebody, after meeting you, is in a worse situation? Could that be what he said? Could he have gone a step further and said, you all ought to be ashamed of yourself that you've done that, that you've acted that way, that you've defrauded somebody. Could he have said that? I don't know. But whatever he said reached this man's heart and Zacchaeus began to say, if I've wronged anybody, I'm going to make it right. He's talking in this verse about restitution. Look, Lord, I give half of my goods to the poor. And if I have taken anything from anyone by false accusation, I restore it fourfold. And Jesus said to him, today salvation has come to this house because he also is the son of Abraham. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. You're on the right path, Zacchaeus. You're acting the way that you need to act. Repentance, when we talk about it being that verb, reaches that point where there has to be restitution. Let me tell you about the man who came into my office who said, I did it, I did it, I did it. There's no doubt about that. And then he asked, what do I need to do? And we talked about, well, what is it that you need to do? What, what things are going to... You're going to have to go to your employer. You're going to have to tell them what you've done. You're going to have to give them an accounting of what you've done. And he did that. He went back to his employer. He laid everything out to his employer. He told them what he took. He told them how he took it so that it could be prevented in the future. He told them what he did with the money that he took or the equipment that he also stole. And he sold them. He told them everything. And then he said, what is it that I can do to make this situation right? And they said, Restitution. Restitution. You need to make it right with this company. You need to pay it back. You know what that man did? He went and sold his house to pay off his debt. Restitution. Look, Lord, here and now I give half of my goods to the poor, and if I have taken anything from anyone by false accusation, I restore it fourfold. I think restitution is one of the great things that we forget about repentance. I'm just going to say I'm sorry, and that takes care of it. And there's never any restitution. There's never any, what can I do to make the situation better? Now, I certainly understand that there are times when restitution can't be made. I understand that. There are things that have been done in the past where maybe the people have even passed away. Or you don't even know where the person is. Or you don't even know about this or that. I understand those things happen and they take place. But that doesn't give us the, under, the, the attitude to say that when it comes to restitution, or when it comes to repentance, I can just leave out restitution and not think anything about it. Well, that's not very logical. We wouldn't leave baptism out of salvation. Right? We, we wouldn't leave prayer out of our worship service. Right? Well, I prayed one time, it ought to cover me now. Well, no, it doesn't work. I repented one time, it ought to take care of everything. No, restitution is sometimes required of us to make repentance effective. To make it personal. To make it necessary. 
want to give you another one. It's the right attitude toward growth. The right attitude towards growth. I need to produce fruit in my life. Go over to Acts chapter 26. Book of Acts. You're in Luke. Turn forward. Chapter 26. And look at verse 20. 26 and verse 20. Paul says this. But declared first to those in Damascus and, and in J Jerusalem and throughout all the region of Judea and then to the Gentiles that they should repent. Turn to God and do works befitting repentance. Now, if I was going to combine any of these things together, I would combine, combine restitution and fruit. The reason I didn't want to do it is because I wanted to stress the two separately. But I would put them together. I think that in producing fruit, we can produce restitution. But I think it's a clear teaching that Paul is saying when he says that we should repent, we should turn to God, and we should do works befitting of repentance. What can I do? How can I make it right? Let me give you another one. Go back to the Gospel of Luke. This one perhaps is more familiar to you. Luke chapter 3. And look at verse 8. Luke chapter 3 and verse 8. Therefore, bear fruits worthy of repentance. And do not begin to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For I say to you that God is able to raise up children to Abraham from these stones. Don't lean on your heritage. Don't say because of who I'm related to. Well, you don't know who my father is. You don't know who my parents are. Well, that's not going to work. What works? Fruit worthy of repentance. What are you doing? How are you living? What are the actions of your life? How has repentance changed you? That's the fruit. Do you see any fruit in the life of Judas? I'm not saying he wasn't sorrowful. But it was a worldly sorrow. Not a godly sorrow. It didn't lead him back into a relationship with God. It led him to satisfy his own gratification. I just want to die. That's never a part of restitution. That's never a part of fruit. That's never a part of repentance. It's a verb. It's an action. Something's being required. We have to grow. We have to change. We have to stretch ourselves. We have to produce fruit. How has this made me different. The one thing that I left out about the story of my friend who came to me shortly after I arrived there is the fact that the company he worked for was owned by a fellow brother in Christ. And because of the fruit that was produced by this man, their relationship was restored. I'm not saying it was easy. And I'm not saying it didn't take some work. But I am saying that their relationship was restored. Can I ask you a personal question? You don't need to answer. But can I ask you a personal question? What's the fruit of your repentance? What is it that's being manifested in your life today that shows you repented yesterday? I'm going to leave you with one more thing. Here we go. One more thing. And, and I think after talking about the right attitude of repentance. Let's talk about the wrong attitude. Real quick. Let's talk about a lack of repentance. Does that matter? Can we slide through? Can we get away? What if the prodigal never went back? What if the prodigal never made the apology? What if the prodigal never tried to get back into the family? Would it be okay? What if Zacchaeus said, yeah, I know I've taken some stuff, but everybody's doing it. And, and you know what I do? I'll cut back. I won't take as much as I've been. And I won't, you know, I'll cut back. What, what, what would be the, the result of the lack of repentance? I want to give you two things. Here's the first one. No chance of salvation. And, and I got my bifocals on, but I imagine your, your jaw just dropped. No chance of salvation. Go back to Luke. Go back to Luke, chapter 13. And I want you to notice what Jesus says. Luke chapter 13 and verse 3. Jesus says, I t well, I'll back up to keep it in the th verse 2. And Jesus answered and said to them, Do you suppose that these Galileans were worse sinners than all other Galileans because they suffered such things? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you will all likewise perish.
Of those 18 of whom the tower in Siloam fell and killed them, do you think that they were worse sinners than all other men who dwelled in Jerusalem? I tell you no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. I think he means that. I think without, re without repentance, there's no salvation. The process doesn't begin. The chain doesn't begin to unfold. The road doesn't begin to get walked down. Without repentance, there's no remission. With no remission, there's no salvation. With no salvation, you're lost. You think repentance is important now? I'll give you one more. Without repentance, it puts us into conflict with Christ. Go over to Revelation. Revelation. I'm going to give you two verses. Chapter 2. The first one is in verse 16. Verse 16. Jesus says this again. He says, Repent, or else I will come to you quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. You repent, or the Word of God is going to come down upon you like you can never imagine. The Word of God is going to judge you. You're going to stand in judgment before God the Father on that day, and the words that have been preached to you are going to rise up, and I'm going to fight you with those words. Conflict with Christ when there's no repentance. Look at verse 22. Look at verse 22. He says this, Indeed, I will cast her, this Jezebel, indeed I will cast her into a sickbed, and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation. You who worship false beasts, you who worship false idols, you who gave yourself over to false religion, you who gave yourself over to man-made denominations, you who were Jezebel with all of these things and committing spiritual adultery... Jesus says this, he says, I will cast her into, a, into great tribulation unless they repent of their deeds. I will co commit an adultery with her into great tribulation unless they repent of their deeds. Boy, does it really matter if my family comes out of the Baptist church? Conflict with Christ. Does it really matter that people in the Mormon church conflict with Christ? Does it really matter that somebody's a spiritual adulterer, adulterer conflict with Christ? What's the key? Repentance. What's the starting place? Repentance. What is essential? Here we go again. Without repentance, there's no remission. Without remission, there's no salvation. Without salvation, there's no hope. Sure, repentance matters. It should matter a great deal to each and every one of us. Biblical repentance and you. You take the message. You determine what you want to do with it. It's yours. I'm just going to present it to you. You can ignore it. You can forget it. You can say, oh, Brother Gallus is out of his mind. You can do whatever you want with it. Biblical repentance is personal. I don't do it for you, and you don't do it for me. I can't make you do it, and you can't make me do it. I can't trick you into doing it, and you can't trick me into doing it. You do what you want with the message, but here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take what the Bible says on this topic. And I'm going to make sure to the best of my ability, and I, I know you're with me. I'm going to make sure to the best of my ability that this verb, repentance, is working in a mighty way in my life. Is it working in a mighty way in your life? If we can encourage you this morning, we'd like to do that. If you need to repent this morning, we'd love to stand by your side and we'd love to encourage you. If you're watching on the internet and you have questions, you want to reach out to us, please do that. The contact information, whatever platform you're watching us on, the contact information is there. You get in touch with us if somebody's here and they're not a member of the church. It begins with that repentance to hear, believe, repent, confess, and to be baptized. If you have not done that, then you're not in a right relationship with God. And if you're not in a right relationship with God, then you're lost. And if you're lost, you're cut off from the blessings that are found in Christ. Forgiveness and salvation in heaven are spiritual blessings found in Christ. If we can help you in any way, you come forward as we stand and sing.